Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Computer Networks, What is a Protocol? Today we're going to be focusing on protocols and we're going to take a detailed look at the protocols underlying the internet. And it turns out that the protocols governing the internet have quite a bit to do with what we can or can't do with the internet and why the internet acts the way it does. So let's start off by answering the question, what in the world is a protocol? I want to start off by talking about why we need protocols. And I think that will give you a better sense of what the protocols actually are. All right, let's go back to the example we had last lecture where I've got a bunch of computers on the Wi-Fi network in a classroom and I'm trying to send a message to my friend. At the end of last lecture, we talked about naming schemes and how to identify individual computers on the network. So at this point, we have a way of identifying each individual computer. So suppose I want to send this message. I don't have to send it to everybody in the classroom now. I can give the specific address for my friend's computer and make sure it goes to her. But what am I actually sending? Am I just sending the message? And she's just going to get a random message saying somebody sent her the I love computer science. Are we going to identify it with the address of the computer? This kind of seems a little bit creepier if we're using the physical or Mac address here. Might be a little bit better if I had the host name, although, although in general, most computers don't actually have host names. Host names are generally reserved for things like web servers, where a lot of people are going to have to access it using a name. What I might want to do is include some sort of information with the message that identifies who sent the message and who that message is going to. So maybe something like this, to Tammy from Patrick. But I have to decide exactly how that's being sent. Remember, what's really being sent from one computer to the other is just a sequence of bits organized into bytes. So, you know, maybe I put her name first, followed by a, that's the ASCII null, that slash zero is the ASCII null, uh, which corresponds to the entire byte being just zeroed out, um, followed by my name. Or I could send my name, followed by the ASCII null, followed by her name. Or I could tack on a from and a to. And then the question comes, well, is the from followed by a colon? Is it followed by a dash? The basic idea here is there's lots of different ways this message can get sent. But what needs to occur is both my computer and her computer need to be in complete agreement on exactly what this message looks like. Not just the contents of the message, but the other information associated with the message, like what format am I going to use to send who the sender is and who the recipient is. And so this is really what a protocol is. A protocol is an agreement between two or more computers on how they plan to carry out a task. Let's take a look at a real life protocol. We're going to look at the HTTP protocol. This is the protocol used by the World Wide Web. And as you can see here, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. We'll actually be talking about exactly what hypertext is next lecture. For now, here's my laptop. It's connected to the internet. And you remember these diagrams from last lecture representing some sort of a network. And I'm connected to part of the network. And then there's a whole bunch of other networks between my network and where the web server is. And that's the dot, 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 the internet. And as you recall from last lecture, the internet is actually an internetwork, a connection of a whole bunch of different networks all combined together. And then on the far side, we've got the web server. Now, I'm representing the web server by just a box. Please don't tell my art teachers I've completely given up on any sort of perspective drawing. But here on this inset here, you can actually see what a web server actually looks like. And what we're seeing here is this is a rack that has a whole bunch of different computers in it. Each of the horizontal components inside this rack actually represents a different computer. And this is what most of the web computers that you're interacting with look like, particularly if you're interacting with a commercial installation. But we're just going to represent it by that square box. Okay, so here's the simplified diagram. I'm getting rid of all the internet stuff, but do keep in mind that internet is still there. Okay, so I've got my computer and I need to contact the web server. We saw previously that 
the web server is identified by the host name and that needs to get converted to an IP address, also known as IP number. And then I'm gonna go ahead and send the request through the internet to the web server. Now, it turns out that there's actually several types of requests I can make to a web server. I can make a get request, which says, hey, you have some information, can you go ahead and send it to me? I can use a put request, which says, hey, I want you to do something for me that's gonna modify your state. Here's some information you might need. And this is used for things like, say, electronic commerce, where I'm actually putting an order. So I'm sending the order information to the server and the server is changing its status so that it remembers my order. Um, there's a delete, which generally you're only gonna be able to do if you have authorization. Anyway, the point is here, there's a whole bunch of different requests. There are several more that I have not covering here. So this all needs to be part of the HTTP protocol. When a, a laptop or some other computer is connecting to the web server, what sort of request can it make of that web server? And in addition to the request type, such as get or post or delete, there's actually a bunch of other information that gets attached to the request. And so these are just a couple examples. We talked about character encodings. In fact, we talked about character encodings the very first day of class when you learned how to uh, store Egyptian hieroglyphs using the Unicode UTF-8 character encoding. So I can send information to the web server saying, these are the sorts of character encodings I can handle. You can send a request to the server saying, hey, I have a copy of this file, but if the file on the server has been modified since a particular date, then I want a new copy of it. You can tell it that you accept particular types of encoding. And in this case, I'm not talking about character encoding. I'm actually talking about the compression technique. So we've talked about compression with images. We talked about compression with sounds. Compression also occurs with files. You guys have experimented with that if you've ever used a zip file. And so one thing that the server can do is it can zip up the files together or use some other compression technique to reduce the amount of space those files take before sending them through the World Wide Web. And so that's what the accept encoding is saying. It's saying, hey, I can handle those zip files if you want to go ahead and send them to me in that format. And so you can see that there's lots of different options that the sender or the requester can do with this particular protocol. And then as far as the response goes, the main part of the response is the files that I'm gonna get back. In this case, I'm representing as an HTML file. We'll talk about HTML again next week. But in addition, there's other things that the web server can send to the requester. That includes, hey, this content is encoded. Here's the encoding. It includes, here's how long this file is good for. Here's when it's gonna expire. And then typically it will also include an idea of how long the file is so that the recipient will know when the file is done transferring. Another important part of the protocol is the status code. You may be familiar with some of these. The 200 code you guys never see, but your computer does receive it. When your computer receives the 200 code, it knows, oh, everything's good. And then we, of course we have the infamous 404, which means you're requesting a file, but that file does not exist. The 403, which in some respects, I think is a little bit harsher, which says, yeah, that file's there, but I'm not giving it to you. You don't have permission. And then 500, which means there's a server error. And in fact, there's a whole slew of these different status codes. And so this is just a simple introduction to HTTP, but mostly I wanted to give you a sense of what a protocol looks like using a real life protocol. And so from this, we can see that yes, a protocol is an agreement, between two or more computers on how they're gonna carry out a task on the network. But we also see that sorts of information that needs to be included. So the protocol should specify what sorts of requests one computer can make of another request, what sort of information would be sent with that, what the format of that information is, and then also important is what to do when something goes wrong. And that's why we have those different error codes we saw there. One topic students often find confusing is what is the relationship between a protocol and a program? So let's take a quick look at that. We've seen how the HTTP protocol works. There are many different programs that support the HTTP protocol. So for example, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, 
These are all programs that run on our personal computers that understand how to communicate with web servers using the HTTP protocol. And as long as our web browser programs understand and follow the same rules, they can interoperate with any of the web servers. Similarly, there are many different types of web servers out there. And as long as the programs on those web servers follow the rules for HTTP, they are able to respond to requests from the different web browsers. I should also mention that while most of us typically think of the program that is making requests to the web server as our traditional web browser, there are other programs out there that make the exact same HTTP request to the web server as our traditional web browsers do. So just to provide a few examples, there are audio web browsers, which people that are visually impaired use, and they will actually be able to read the web page to somebody. And then there are other programs such as the Google search bot, which doesn't even involve a human being. It just makes requests to web pages and uses those web pages to build up its database, which it can use to tell us how to find particular topics. The bottom line is the protocol just specifies a set of rules that different programs need to follow if they want to interact with the other computers on the network that are planning to work together to carry out this task. Many people can write different programs following those protocols. And in fact, as we've seen here with HTTP, they often do. In the next series of videos, we're going to take a look at the actual protocols on the internet. It turns out that the protocols on the internet are what is referred to as layered. This is a relatively complex topic, but by understanding the layered protocols and how they work, you will have a much, much stronger understanding of how the internet works. So we're going to go ahead and go over this. The next video is going to talk about what layered protocols actually are. And then after that, we'll take a closer look at the actual layers used on the internet. I'll talk to you soon.